This is How We Doing It, a podcast about resilience. Join me, your host, Howie Craw, as I explore the true stories of those who have been knocked down by life's biggest challenges and despite insurmountable odds, went on to achieve great success in both life and business. Become a master of resilience and you'll see that anything is possible. Let's do this. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the How We Doing It podcast. I'm your host, Howie Craw. My guest today is Seth Goldman, a business leader, philanthropist, entrepreneur, and legend in the food and beverage industry who almost needs no introduction. Seth is a visionary and a disruptor who has touched millions upon millions of lives around the world while turning food and beverage industries upside down. Chances are you have had some of his products. He is the co-founder of Honest Tea, a company he started out of his garage in 1998 with about $250,000 in sales that year that grew to more than $75 million when the company was sold in 2011 to Coca-Cola. Today, the company will do over $600 million in revenues in 140,000 locations. His newest business explores healthier, more sustainable alternatives to meat. He is the executive chairman of Beyond Meat, a company that's focused on a better way to feed the planet with delicious plant-based burgers, beef, sausage, crumbles, and more. Seth is also co-author of the New York Times bestseller, Mission in a Bottle, and is father to three amazing boys and has an incredible partner in life in his wife, Julie. Seth, it's my honor to have you on this show. It's great to be with you, Howie, and uh, or I call you Howie now. I used to know you as Howard, but uh, <laughs> it's great to be with you. And, and um, you've just been such a wonderful friend and ally and investor in, in me and in my family and in our, our sons. And so it's really fun to be with you. We think about some of the things you've accomplished as a disruptor in an industry and how we do, and it talks a lot about resilience. People think it's easy. You know, to start a company is one thing. You know, when you think back on some of the challenges in these companies that you've built, how do you stay true to your mission, stay true to your values to continue to go up against all the naysayers and then take it to where you've taken it today? It, it really is about the mission because you got to have something bigger to believe in. If, if the only thing that drives, at least for me, if the only thing that this is about is making money, uh, there's easier ways to make money. Um, but for me, because of what I believe in, and, and I think the work we do at Honest Tea is important. I think the work we've done at Yeah Meat is important and, and powerful in terms of transforming diets, in terms of transforming uh, the, the impact we have on the environment. Um, not to mention, you know, with Beyond Meat, the impact we have on the whole livestock animal system. And so these are things I believe in and passionately. And so that's what keeps me going and, and fired up. And, and of course, getting that feedback from the consumers who love it and from the suppliers who benefit from it. It's, 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 uh, for me, it's all a circle. Where did you begin this passion for sustainability, organics, free trade? I know I met you in the late 90s, and you were talking about green before I really saw it in the world. I mean, you introduced me, and I know Jonah introduced Natalie to become a vegetarian. <laughs> so how, how did, where did it begin for you? How did it start? Yeah, I think the biggest thing I got from my parents was this belief that if there's something in the world you care about, you need to act on it. It's not a, we're not, it's not a, um, you know, it's not a show that you're watching. It's a show you're acting in. And so um, you don't just see things happen. If you think the wrong things are happening, you need to take action. And so uh, I'm somebody, and, and especially, you know, through my wife and kids have always appreciated the natural world and, and how beautiful it is and also how fragile it is. 
And so um, to understand that we've got to be able to protect these things for the long term so that if we if we want to continue to benefit from it, if we want our children to continue to benefit from it, got to take action on that. And I, I've always thought of myself more as an activist than as a, a business person. And, and, you know, being an entrepreneur was almost a, sci- a byproduct of acting on issues I care about. Right. I know that uh, you started out in your early years. I don't know if people know this, but that you taught English in Beijing. And then I didn't realize you met Julie Weiss while teaching English in, in Russia. Well, I uh, so what happened was I taught I spent a year after college teaching uh, English because I was interested in in China and Russia, and, and I realized that since I didn't speak those languages well, the best way to learn was to be an English teacher, and then I could live in those countries, and I <laughs> had a way to get to support myself. Um, and then in between my time in China and then my time in Russia, I came back and worked on a presidential campaign in 1988, and that's I met Julie on, a, on the campaign trail, and then she uh, was willing to come and live with me in Russia in uh, 1989 and 90. So. Um, that was, uh, that was how we connected. Well, that was a great decision on Julie's behalf and you got very lucky that she accepted. I got very lucky there. <laughs> I just said that. I mean, good decision by both, but you know, one of the yeah. things I know that you always said to me is that your foray into private enterprise could promote the public good. And, and what a great example, because with Honest Tea, I know that you were going over and making these trips to India and impoverished nations and protecting fields and using those tea leaves in your ultimate product. Yeah, yeah, no, it's been um, wonderful to see these communities. And one of the things we learned early on was that tea is one of the world's cheapest commodities. And so... Uh, it's one of those things where, look, it, it, we could we can move this to fair trade, which would bring more resources to these communities, but we could do it without, you know, cr- we could still have an economically competitive model. We're, we're only spending a few pennies per bottle, but let's just spend a little bit more. Let's get higher quality tea, and let's make sure we can make these communities sustainable on, you know, um, for the long term. Honest Tea, 22 years ago, was started. Last week... The announcement that you were stepping away from the company. What's that feel like? Well, I, I wrote a blog about it and I talked about it like I, you know, raising a child. Um, and, you know, I have three sons. The youngest is uh, 22, so he's just about six months older than Honest T. And at a certain point, you got to be able to let your child go off into the world and succeed on his or her own. And, and, uh, I feel like Honesty has grown up. We we put a ton of in, in, effort into it, a ton of uh, energy and passion into it, and now we've sp- spread to uh, basically every continent. We've um, uh, got it established as an organic, fair trade, and low calorie drink, and those are the key things. We wanted to make sure as we built the brand that um, its its mission was built into its DNA. And what I mean by that is, you know, the calorie claim. That's something you can't. You can't change. You can't really um, sort of shortcut or the organic seal. That's something that's verified by a third party, as is fair trade. And so, if we make sure these characteristics are are brewed into the product, literally, you know, brewed into the product, then I, I feel much better about its ability to stand up and keep going. And and for me, so that was the first thing. I wanted to make sure I wasn't abandoning a a, a child who couldn't, you know, thrive on its own. Then, you know, as, as we've talked about, I, I am an entrepreneur at heart. I, um, and so I felt like I got to find the next challenge. I have, uh, when I got to that transition point where, where Coca-Cola bought Honest Tea back in 2011, I uh, managed to, to get involved with Beyond Meat, which has just been such a wonderful gift to me to help build this new enterprise. And, and I'm passionate about it in a way I didn't even know I could be after building Honest Tea, but it's been a joy to, to be involved with Beyond Meat. And, uh, and now that I step away from Honest Tea, uh, I intend to continue doing my work with Beyond Meat and then also um, you know, plan to start up another enterprise uh, because the work with Beyond Meat is, is a halftime role. I'm executive chair of the board, and, and I'm uh, very engaged in what we do here, and, and, but, I, but it's not running the company. We have a great CEO, Ethan Brown, who does that, and I'm happy to be his partner in, in, in building the business forward and driving it forward. When you talk about 
being involved with new ventures, have you put your finger yet on what it is the next venture will be? I haven't announced it yet, but I can tell you, and and, and I think, you know, uh, what did they say, past performance, <laughs> in my case, is at least an indicator of future return. And so it's going to be a, a company uh, that's involved in food. It's going to be involved in sustainability and health. And, um, you know, certainly around being a, a, a change agent, you know, making sure that we can make products that are healthy uh, and, and sustainable, available to more people, and helping people connect the dot between their own personal actions and the impact those decisions have on the planet, because we are in a crisis. You know, I think even just two years ago, people would say, oh, climate change is terrible. It's going to make the earth harder for our children or our grandchildren to live in. And then it went from grandchildren to children. And now it goes, you know, literally here we are this month where we've had you know, floods in Venice, we've had fires in California, and climate change has made it hard for us to live. Uh, and we're, we're just at the tip of what's going to only accelerate. So we as a, as a planet need to accelerate the, the, the way we um, change our behavior to that impacts the climate. And the single biggest impact any individual has on, on the climate is the decision uh, of what we eat. Um, you know, you, it's great if you drive a hybrid, and I hope you do, and it's great if you recycle, and I hope you do, and uh, bike to work, all those things. Um, they still are going to be small relative to the decisions you make about what you eat. And so that's what um, this next enterprise will be focused on. Can't wait to hear more about it. You know I'm a big believer in anything you get behind. So if there's anything from my end that I can do, please uh, keep me uh, in mind. In terms of it, it's so true in, in, you know, really we are what we eat or how much, how conscious we are. And, you know, since I know you, Seth, I mean, you've brought so much awareness to not only me, but my family. And you know that Natalie is a, is a vegan and she's a vegan chef and she's now getting her, her master's in sustainability and organics. And, you know, it's really uh, in my family. And last week we were talking about Venice. What a sad situation. I mean, we see the pictures, but if, if you've been there and you know what a great place it is, it's one of the treasures in our world. It's, it's underwater, and it's just, did it have to be? Or, like you said, these fires that keep popping up. And, you know, so when do we get to that tipping point when people realize, I mean, remind me, how much cattle do we slaughter a year? What's the mm. number? No. Uh, what- you know, literally billions of animals are killed every year, uh, and it is, it's done, it's done in a way where it's disconnected from people. So when people go to the shelf and buy a product, they really don't have, have a, um, a consciousness about all that's involved in, in um, the creation of it in terms of the impact it has on the environment, obviously the impact it has on the animals, um, and, and so... You know, look, we at Beyond Meat, we're not trying to demonize the meat industry, but to the extent people can be aware of those decisions, I, I, I always have said, and I've always believed, that an informed consumer is the best ally and best advocate we have for a better world, because the more people understand what's involved in getting these products to the shelf, um, you know, that's just a, a it, it leads to better informed decisions. And, and so, you know, the difference in impact um, between a product like a a Beyond Burger versus a Beef Burger is just dramatic. We did a life cycle analysis that um, was conducted by the University of Michigan, and they looked at what's required to make a Beyond Burger versus uh, a Beef Burger, and they found it uses 99% less water, 93% less land, creates 90% fewer greenhouse gases, so just a totally different uh, environmental footprint. And so uh, we... we, um, it, the more people can get informed about that, I think, the better. So, so how is it then that with all that's going on, there's still all these people who could be in denial of climate change? How do I process that? <laughs> well, it starts, uh, you know, look, there's a whole political climate where people are trying to deny it, too. Um, you know what I've said though in the business world it's not something you can deny it's just it's 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 factual and so you know if you had a business leader of a major company who who tried to pretend climate change didn't exist you uh, you wouldn't invest in that I wouldn't invest in that company in fact I'd short that stock because it's it's not just that it exists it's here 
Um, and, and like I say, the things going on, the, you know, we've had sort of, you know, at climate events, they call it the one in a hundred years storms that we've had, you yeah, know, five a year. <laughs> <laughs> right. We get, yeah. we get them every few months. Yeah. So this kind of stuff just is, it, this isn't coincidence. It's not a freak thing. It's a direct consequence of the actions that, um, we've been, you know, people have been taking. You know, so being a, a change agent is not easy. Oh, it's not easy. It's not easy, but it's fun. And it's, it's, it's you know, uh, my point of view is if you're not doing something that you believe in, um, what's, you know, what's the point? So uh, for me, it's, it's kind of the only way. Right. And I, and I love that in you because a lot of people get t- caught between the tensions of what they really believe, what's right, and maybe what Wall Street wants to buy into or hear. And that's something I know that both Honest Tea and Beyond Meat have always stood behind their values and beliefs. And you never kowtowed to any of that. I, I recall at different times when we were in the growth stages of Honest Tea, you know, it, it, you, weren't, you weren't changing the product. You weren't putting something in there that you didn't believe. And I like to say you won because you held <laughs> your ground. But it is tougher, right? Look, there were always times where we'd meet with an account and they'd say, well, you know, if your product was sweeter, we'd be able to give you this mainstream distribution or we'd give you this, or if your product was cheaper, you know, by which they meant not organic, we'd give you this opportunity. And, you know, that's a longer path. That's one of the reasons that this was a 22-year journey. You know, you know we sold it, Coca-Cola, in 2011, but, um, you know, I've stuck through it all, the, you know, eight years past that time um, because... I did want to make sure it got built to scale and, and without compromise. Right. Will it will it remain in Bethesda? Uh, that's something for Coca Cola to figure out. I think they're going through that decision point now. But I, I'm going to remain in Bethesda. That's all I I know what I I got I know you. What I can control. <laughs> so so Seth is an athlete, and I know that uh, we can talk about in college you did cross country and track, correct? Right. Right. And I think uh, in your early years, I know the boys like to talk. Did you wrestle? I wrestled in high school, but I did not wrestle well. So I, I, I loved it as an activity. I, it, it did amazing things for my character development and my resilience. But um, I, I did not distinguish myself <laughs> so, as a great wrestler. But what, the, the reason why I mentioned that, I can't remember which one of your boys, but when we were having a conversation about resilience, they said that you always taught them a lesson about something that happened to you with wrestling. Do you do you know what I'm referring to? I'm not sure which did one. You, did uh, you have a losing streak? Oh yeah. Well, I lost my first season. I lost every match except the one I got a forfeit. Um, so that yeah, was. <laughs> so <laughs> that that's it. I, I try to remember that. Oh yeah. Well, I don't brag about that. <laughs> But, you know, that was a good test. Like, are you going to stick with this or are you going to take the, you know, it's easier to quit. It's harder to, to stay in the ring. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the thing about wrestling is it's a, there's nowhere to hide, you know. For the first of all, there's nowhere to hide physically. You're in this, you know, basically a, a tight, you know, <laughs> you're in some tights that are uh, pretty revealing and you're just, you're so you're almost naked. You're, you're if you get beaten, you get beaten badly. And um, it's kind of humiliating. And so I got humiliated for 10 matches in my freshman, uh, my sophomore year, because that's when I started. And then, you know, by my senior year, I got to, to wrestle a little above 500. And uh, look, still not great, but I, uh, you know, I gained tremendous confidence from it. And, and I, I never encourage anybody to lose. But, um, you know, every time you lose is an opportunity to learn and, and to gain something from it. And I gained <laughs> I had enough losing experiences in wrestling to to gain, you know, what's hard, it's, it's not hard to lose. It's hard to make sure you get something out of it every time. And so every time I lost and then, and then it's hard to get back in the ring because every time you lose, it's easy to take that defeat and just say, all right, this isn't for me, or I'm going to go do the next thing. And then it's harder to get back in and say, I'm going to go in there and I'm, I'm going to fight. And there was, there was one time in my sophomore year, my brother who, who did wrestle and wrestled well, on me, Russell, he says, and he sent me a letter after one match. He said, you know, felt like you, he says, he says I, I, I'm not focused on whether you win or not. I want to see, you know, are you giving it everything? And then there was one match. He said, I don't think, you know, I felt like you just, so you went out there and you knew you were going to get pinned. And 
uh, I still have that letter because he was right. I just, I just didn't have the heart for it. I said, all right, I'm not, I'm not, I, I know I may not win every match, but I'm never going to go in and just give up. I'm going to go in and, and fight and do my best. And, 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 uh, so that was a really important moment for me. And, and it took, it certainly helped me over the years here as we, you know, with both companies, we obviously had a lot of challenges. So that, that's, you know, what would you say is required to go back in, to get back in that ring and mentally to go back in? What does it require? Yeah, well, part of it is you do have to, um, you know, re- sort of renew your energy and you got to just make sure you understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. And, and that gives you that big picture perspective. So that's part of it. Part of it is a little bit of um, reflection on your own, and and uh, you know, you, you, it's one thing to tell people just get back in there. It's another thing to say, okay, you go in back in there with the right attitude and the right mindset. And so part of that is okay, you got you got to be able to learn from what went wrong, uh, and then part of it is you know, literally just having a, a strong uh, will and saying, you know, I'm, I I'm, I believe I can do this, and and so um, that. That's just something you just got to develop. As I hear you talk about, you know, a simple thing like wrestling in your high school years and then watching you in the TEO role at Honest T, I am sure there were moments you were getting pinned to the mat. I'm sure (laughs) that there were plenty of times. Why don't you share a moment where it just was so difficult where you think, I can't do this anymore, but then you just got the fortitude and you made it work. What, What comes to mind? Yeah, the, the toughest one for Honest T over the early years was getting distribution because we we needed to be on those beverage trucks. We needed to be with the guys who were distributing Snapple and Nantucket Nectars in Arizona. We needed those guys in order to get to the shelf. And we, I went repeatedly to, in front of these guys and, you know, I'd get a meeting somehow. Made to be, you know, generally nice as a, you know, they'd listen, but they'd just say, we don't see this working. We don't see this attracting a mainstream audience, partially because they were drinking these sweet products that were, um, and ours was so different and partially because they didn't, hadn't heard of organic. So they didn't you know, think that was anything worthwhile. Uh, and so, you know, we just, I just kept working at it and I'd say, all right, well, I'll be back next year. And literally, uh, we had a distributor up in new England. I would, I probably made uh, almost well, at least, um, Seven consecutive, you know, every spring I'd go up and talk to him, and eventually we got him, and he became a great distributor. But it was just just keep going at it, and every year I'd have a little bit better story to tell and better results I could share. And so I had that long term view that this was going to work. And um, you know, I think the other thing that helped is I was always polite and personable, and and you know, um, they you know they had heard good things from others about me, so it wasn't like. Um, because all those other actions do uh, make an impression on people. If if you handle them the wrong way, um, you know that kind of thing um, also gets back to these folks. So, you know, just do the right thing every time with every person, and uh, you know that way your story holds up. Yep, that's uh, being transparent, and I always love the name. You know, I love that. I, I know Barry and you came up with like, let's do it honestly. But then it was like, oh, mm-hmm. honest tea. And that, that name <laughs> always really resonated me because everything about you, Barry, and the company was so honest. So flipping over to burgers now, uh, it, it's something that now everybody knows about these plant-based substitutes and people, I think, would be more, more willing. But what was that like? in the early days yeah. of trying because now you you know you're you're in an industry that everybody wants a piece of but i know this is not an overnight success i know that no. you, you met yeah. ethan somewhere around 2010 and maybe you joined in there what around 13 12 13 and you were in a lab making this stuff and it sounded like the furthest thing from Earth that like what a pea protein <laughs> burger, and tell me about those early days. <laughs> so um, 
I, my family's been vegetarian for 14 years now, and we've always been happy with the decision from an ethical perspective, little um, less happy with it from a culinary perspective, by which I mean veggie burgers just never satisfied us. We were always disappointed. And, you know, we got three sons, all athletes, and so like to eat a lot of food, want to have cookouts, and we just couldn't have cookouts because the the veggie burgers of the, their you know early childhood just was always dissatisfying. And I, I've joked before that veggie burgers were a conspiracy by the meat industry to discourage people from becoming vegetarian because they try it once and then they say, "I don't, I don't need to be a vegetarian that badly." Uh, and so, in 2012, um, my wife Julie read this article about this company getting up and running out here on the West Coast. Uh, called Beyond Meat, and the goal was to replicate the taste and texture of meat using only plants. And the company had been started in 2009. They'd sold into some food service accounts in Whole Foods and that kind of thing, but they hadn't really broken into retail, and they were just preparing to do that. And I uh, read the article, and I thought, boy, that would be a good um, company. I'd love to see these guys succeed, partially because we, my family would <laughs> could benefit from a, a good product, but also because that's a Space, I think, makes sense. Um, you know, as I said, both for reasons that we chose to become vegetarian, but also environmental reasons. And so I just sent one of these emails, kind of a blind email to info at beyondmeat.com and said, hey, read this article about what you guys are doing. If there's any way I can help, I've, I've learned a thing or two about scaling a food business, a mission driven food business, and would love to help out and uh, got. You know, in touch with Ethan, the CEO, and and um, started a, a dialogue that you know, um, event it resulted in me becoming an investor and board member and advisor. And we would check in every Friday, and then it was like, well, we got more challenges. Let's check in every other day, and and we've kept that up because. Uh, and and then I came on as executive uh, chair of the board in 2015, and it's just been such a fun business to grow. And when I joined, it was um, and we had some chicken strips, which were decent for what they were, but the product's gotten so much better now. And so we've got the Beyond Burger and Beyond Sausage. And um, we've just seen a, a, a explosion of, of both quality of the product, but also the consumer response. You know, the most recent one we've done is this launch at Duncan with the uh, Beyond Breakfast Sausage Patty, which is just phenomenal. I uh, so I can attest that I uh, sent you a photo a few weeks ago. Uh, Max lives over on Murray Street in Tribeca, and there it was, a big sign right away. And I'm like, okay, let me go have one. And Seth, it's not the kind of thing I start my day with at Dunkin' Donuts, but it was delicious. It was incredible. And uh, yeah. do you ever get tired of my photos texting to you of all the different places I find the Beyond product? No, no, it's fun. It's it's fun to see um, the response it's getting. It's fun to see it expand, and that's what every entrepreneur hopes for, right? You know that you you, you bring something to market. People respond well to it. They they incorporate it into their lifestyles, and then you just see it continue to spread to other restaurants and other channels and other outlets. And and so it's been really fun. You know what I love too is that you started out by saying Julie read an article. Think about that. Julie reads an article, piques your interest, and you send an email. That just shows that, you know, we think, oh, no, I can't email that person or I can't do that. But anything's possible. You just have to put yourself out there. You got to show up. And, And that's like, think about this relationship that you have with Ethan that really started because Julie read an article. Well, even going further back, it really starts with Jonah, our our oldest son, because he was the one who made us vegetarian. He was the one who started asking these questions we couldn't answer around how come, you know, if we can meet our nutritional and dietary needs without killing animals, how come we aren't, how come we're killing animals? And, you know, I didn't have a good answer. So, yeah, you're right. I mean, Julie has, has played a critical role in everything I've been involved with. Uh, but so, you know, I've learned so much from my kids and You know, our son, Ellie, um, he was the one who asked me as I was making lunch one morning, he says, how come you're putting these really sugary drinks in my lunchbox? And that led to the creation of Honest Kids. So uh, there's good ideas all around, and sometimes you just got to figure out what it takes to act on them. So, you know, you mentioned Jonah. I mean, I remember we're at a Little League game. There was a typical doubleheader. 
Jonah took my daughter, Natalie, and a bunch of other kids on a field trip in the woods. And Natalie comes out and says, I'm not eating chicken anymore, Dad. And I said, why? (laughs) And she said, Jonah told me what they do and where they're made and blah, blah, blah. She goes, I'm done. I can't believe you and Mom and my daughter, Natalie. And you said that that was about 14 years ago. Natalie's 24. I keep saying she turned vegetarian at 8. Jonah has an amazing influence on lots of people. Speaking of Jonah, <laughs> speaking of Jonah, I was honored to be with you at the opening of Plant Burger in Silver Spring, Maryland, inside the Whole Foods. And I, I'm not living around there, but I am craving. What was that burger I had? Describe that to me. <laughs> oh, it's really fun. So, um, you know, this started with this, actually it started with a, a panel I went to. I, I spoke in a DC um, food uh, policy discussion and uh, sitting next to me was Spike Mendelson, the chef of a um, uh, bunch of restaurants and a uh, wonderful guy. And so I, you know, brought in a cooler bag and gave him some burgers and he went home and he cooked them. He said, these are amazing. Uh, they were beyond burgers, of course. And said, we should start a plant-based burger restaurant. And uh, so I said, that sounds great. Now, because of my role with Coca-Cola and Honest Tea, I wasn't able to be involved directly, but I was help, able to help connect the dots. And uh, um, so Julie, my wife, got involved, and Jonah uh, took on the role of marketing. And Spike makes these burgers, which uh, the restaurant's called Plant Burger. It's based in Silver Spring, Maryland, in the Whole Foods there. And it is just a phenomenal burger. And it's just a great burger, period. Now, the fact that it's plant-based, you know, is a whole other plus to it. But um, I, it's a good product on its own. Right, but there was a special one you made that night, and I see it's on the menu. Uh, it, it's, you, can you describe it? Is this the mushroom bacon burger? There you go. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it uses mushrooms, uh, but, you know, uh, and then flavors them, and then they be, uh, into sort of ta- replicate the taste of bacon. And it's just, a, yeah, it's a phenomenal burger, and, and it's been so much fun to see the response to that restaurant. And, of course, with Jonah, as we've talked about, he's someone who's very passionate about this, so he's the perfect emissary for this. Yeah, no, it's great. I can't wait to get back. I'll be back in town in a few weeks. I'll be sure to take the family there. <laughs> and now, a word from our sponsor. Persist Communications. Marketers or advertisers or any and all companies looking to increase their conversions and customer contact. Persist helps you follow up on prospects, customers, and clients, automatically connecting them to your staff using calls, voicemails, texts, and emails, all for only around $7 per day per user. Increase your ROI 15 to 25% or more without spending any additional funds on advertising or marketing. Go to forpersist.com. That's F O R P E R S I S T to schedule a free demo or call the number on the website. Now let's go back to the show. Seth, there's uh, other competitors trying to come into this same space now. What's, what's your take on where it is or how big it can get and just your overall opinion on what you're feeling or what you're seeing? Obviously, Wall Street now is following it. Congratulations again on your successful IPO you had a few months ago. Uh, what's, your, what's your take on the future of it? Yeah, look, it's it, my point of view is it's great for us all to be building a category. This is, you think about where we were, where these products just weren't on the shelf at all, or at least not in the meat section. There, there were lots of, as we've talked about, you know, in inferior veggie burgers out there. But um, we want to change people's diets that can't do it on our own. So there's others coming out and, you know, they're going to do it a different way. 
our, we know in order to succeed, and this is like any company, you've got to be the best. You've got to have the best taste. You've got to have the best messages. You've got to have the most relevance to consumers. And you've got to have the best relationships with the, the key customers to, to build this. So that's what we're focused on. And, uh, you know, we obviously have made choices around ingredients uh, that we think are important. So we've chosen to be non-GMO with our ingredients. We chose not to use soy because there's a lot of baggage with that. So, you know, consumers, whether it's allergies or other concerns, and um, that's fine for us and others will make choices as well. But um, we, we, we think about the, the competition here is, is not others making plant-based burgers. It's really the meat industry as a whole. So a lot of opportunity for everybody. It's huge. I mean, the numbers on the meat industry, I was doing some research. I mean, they're trillions. It, it's a big, big industry. In terms of industry trends, I know that you, you see all the emerging. I know that we run into each other at industry trade shows. What do you think or what does the future hold for us in terms of other new ideas, products, or segments of the industry? What does your crystal ball see? Well, uh, there is bound to continue to be opportunity in the plant-based food space. So, Obviously, what we're doing with Beyond Meat is one place. Plant-based dairy, you're seeing a lot of growth. You're seeing a lot of growth. Um, I don't think anyone's cracked the code on plant-based cheese. I think that's a big opportunity. I think uh, plant-based uh, egg as well. I think um, there's a lot of opportunities there because those are the occasions where people still, you know, may, they may not eat meat anymore, but they'll, they'll have those other products. And then probably plant-based fish is an area where, you know, also some opportunity. Fish a little bit less so because... I think consumers have in their mind that fish is healthy and sustainable, even even if you know some of us may differ, and so um, they don't feel as much of a pull. Whereas you know with Beyond Meat, we went right to the red meat space first because that's where the biggest uh, range of category concerns are. Um, so those are big areas of opportunity. A lot of work to be done on packaging. Um, these are um, this this is a space where. Um, Consumers will, um, you know, want what if you if you have concerns around climate, then you know that's the next thing. How do you get packaging that is uh, more sustainable? And so that's an ongoing challenge too. Right, we are seeing some strides in that, but I know that uh, as I was talking to you, I have a plastic bottle here, and it's telling me that it's plant-based plastic or something. So I guess there are strides yeah. being made. That's, and that's a challenge there because sometimes plant-based plastic is not recyclable, and so you almost contaminate the waste stream. Um, so, yeah, this, this is uh, it's going to be you know there's going to be some half steps along the way until we get to something that really works. But look, our recycling system is it does not work, and it's a huge issue, and we've got to we've got to find solutions. Yeah, so it's uh, it's great to see that uh, you never stop. You're always looking to see how you can better the world, the planet that we live in. And you've really touched upon so many lives. And I, I loved, and maybe you could share with the audience, just your when you created Honest Kids and you finally got it into the Happy Meal at McDonald's, that's a billion-calorie yeah. story. So you could share that one quickly. Sure. Yeah, that was, um, you know, Honest Kids, is, as I mentioned, this brand we created more than 10 years ago with the vision of trying to make lower calorie organic drinks available to younger consumers. And we um, brought it first to retail. It's done extremely well um, because every parent wants their kids to have healthy drinks, but they've also got to taste good to the kid. And so um, Honest Kids has just kind of met that perfect spot. Uh, and then we started going to restaurants, and the first restaurant chain, big one to take it on, was uh, Wendy's, uh, and that was great. And then Subway took it on, and Chick Fil A, and then of course McDonald's is the, you know, the highest volume chain. And so getting them to take it on was a really big step, and it's just been phenomenal to see. And, and then we think about the impact of that. We uh, brought Honest Kids to McDonald's, and just the end of 2017, and over the next 12 months, we sold over. 200 million units, and they, that drink is 35 calories. It replaced a drink that had 80 calories. And so there's a 45 calorie differential times over 200 million. It means we've helped remove over a billion calories from the American diet. And that's just a, um, that's really exciting to think about the impact we, and here we as, you know, McDonald's, Coca Cola, and Honest Tea can all have collectively. That's awesome. And in terms of, there were some fun things going on. I know that there was a, 
chicken sandwich war recently between Popeyes and Chick Fil A, and somehow there was uh, in Smyrna, Georgia. You dressed up a, a chicken place, and you did a Beyond Chicken sandwich, and I think the lines were four hours long. Are there plans? <laughs> are there plans to roll that out? Well, it was really exciting. I mean, they they sold out in five hours. They sold, you know, basically everything out, and that was uh, they thought they were going to have enough product for days, and so uh, it was wonderful to see that response. And so now we huddle with. KFC, and we talk about what you know how to follow up on that, and that's where we are in in that discussion phase. And you know what what is your advice to anyone wanting to take on the status quo? Just what's your advice to people that want to make a difference like you're doing, but really take on the status quo? Yeah. Well, first of all, don't have any illusions that it's easy. It's it's work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Uh, and, 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 but it's fun, but it's work and it's just, you know, so what I always say is think about where the activists are, uh, think about the, um, what causes people are, you know, basically willing to work full time for. And often, you know, as you know, activists work on, uh, lean salary. And so what people believe in something so strongly, um, that, you know, they're able to, um, devote something to this because they believe in it. And so uh, that's a great place to start because what it usually highlights is an inefficiency in the market. And so for me, you can talk about whether it was calories or the environmental impact or fair trade or look at Beyond Meat and think about animal treatment or environmental, climate change. These are issues people work on as activists full time. And so say, okay, well, how do I address those same concerns in a for profit company? And then can you connect the dots? And so look at what. You know, there have been people who've run campaigns um, for decades trying to get people to eat less meat. Well, what was missing wasn't the people, I think, understood that rationale. What was missing was a substitute that was satisfying to them. And so that's the, that's the whole Beyond Meat plug. I talk about, you know, there's an interesting story. I actually wrote a blog about it a few years ago. It was a tale of two Henrys. I talked about this American diplomat named Henry Byrd who um, founded the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. And his first cause was the treatment of horses. He was so concerned about, he, he had worked in Russia and he'd seen these horses just literally work to, you know, work to death and, and, and treated so badly. And so he worked, came back to the U.S. and he passed all kinds of laws to get um, uh, rules passed. So horses had to be rested and watered a certain amount. So he did a lot to help horses. But somebody else came along, another guy named Henry in the 1800s, who did a lot for horses. It was Henry Ford. And he, you know, if you ask him, and I don't know this firsthand, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if Henry Ford didn't really care about horses. But his work had the impact of transporting or, tr you know, trans uh, taking the term horsepower and moving it from the horse to the engine. And if you ask a horse who did the most to help your quality of life, and, and if the horse could answer in a, in a way that we could understand it, you, the horse might say, well, Henry Berg had his heart in the right place. He really cared about horses. But Henry Ford transformed the way we live. And as a matter of fact, all those laws that Henry Berg passed, which you know were useful, but they almost became irrelevant because once you had a combustion engine, horses didn't mean to be worked to the ground because someone would say, I've got my tractor or I've got my, you know, my bus or my truck that's going to do all the work that a horse used to do. So sometimes you know, an entrepreneur can tap into a, a market inefficiency and bring a solution out that has a huge impact on other issues besides just the business itself. You know, when you say it that way, it all seems so simple. Sure, we all want we all wanted an <laughs> no, alternative the to me. The execution is the challenge. Right? The execution is the challenge. And boy, have you executed and I am so proud of you. And we're all better off for the whole Goldman family, for everything that all five of you do. And to know you is to know your sons. You know how I feel about them. Uh, they're all near and dear to me. And uh, I saw yesterday I was learning 
learning a little bit about new flavors of plant-based ice cream coming out of San Francisco. Yeah. And all I wanted to know was, where do I get them? Where do I get them? And uh, I know the flavors will be there, but we'll end on something simple. We'll end on something easy. And I, I said it before, but your relationship with Julie and getting to know your whole family has just been a real uptick for all of the cross and we really, really glad that we're all together. But uh, I'll ask you, and you might not be able to answer this first one because you don't have a lot of time, but do you ever watch television? And if so, <laughs> is there anything that a program or a series that you would binge watch? A um, few things. So first of all, big New England sports fan. Oh, so I, I know that. I knew it had to come out. <laughs> I knew that had to come out. I've been spoiled because when I grew up, um, you know, struggle years of struggle. I mean, Red Sox never won anything, and the Patriots were in the dog, you know, the bottom of the of their uh, division. So this is just a renaissance uh, that I've been able to live through. So that's always fun. So um, and then just yep. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. And, and then uh, and then Julie and I will just you know um, usually once a week we'll watch some kind of. Uh, detective show or, or something like that. Just, just mostly to spend some time, you know, it is, I've been paying a lot of attention these days to this idea of the quiet mind and you have to have, yes, it's, I love work and I get we're intense with it. And obviously with the two companies, there's plenty to do, but there's also times where you got to just let your brain sort of relax and, and absorb information and, and stay off the phone um, and sort of, you know, be told a story and, and, and lose in, lose yourself in that. So I, I do try to, um, you know, get some, some, you know, cups and sun off and that kind of thing. Um, but on the most, you know, regular basis, not, not watching a lot of TV. Uh, just going back to the sports stuff a minute. How hard was it for you watching Ellie play for the Yankees as a child? <laughs> well, we never called it the Yankees. It was called the Bombers. So that made me feel, that made me feel better as a term. I didn't feel like he was a, a regular, you know, in a y- Yankees uniform on a regular basis. I did get him on some of those rec teams with a Yankee hat. I have pictures <laughs> of them, Seth. Um, in terms of when isolated you... incidents. Excuse me? <laughs> there was, those were isolated in- incidents. I don't know. Photos for a lifetime. Now, when you just said <laughs> quiet mind, do you do any meditation? I don't do meditation specifically or per se, um, but I, I do uh, do exercise every day for an hour. And that for me, um, usually without any music or anything. And so for me, that's just a chance to be out in, in and I'm always doing it outside. I, I as much as I can, I'll, I'll, I'll stick outside because that's where, you know, I get the, the best sort of ability to just, um, you know, be connected to the natural world around me. And especially given that a lot of the work is done indoors, I want to make sure I get, like I say, at least an hour. Uh, but I also do, um, I'm very fortunate in both jobs that I bike to work and that gives me another opportunity to be outdoors. So, um, uh, so, I, so for me, those, that's a meditative activity. Um, even if it's not formally meditation. I love to tell the story that you and I compete or I should say, I'm enlisted, you compete. We were at a triathlon about a year ago, and we realized we were both there. And when I called you, when I got through the finish line, you were halfway home already. So, uh, (laughs) but we were at the same place at the same time, just finished at different times. And my last question is a person who has absolutely traveled the world, and I know how important that is to you and your family. If you could recommend one place for us to go and visit, where would it be? Around the world? Anywhere in the world. Oh, boy. Well, you know, um, for us, we've been spoiled to get to these tea gardens in, it, in India. Um, they're just these, the most pristine, beautiful communities. And they're beautiful in terms of the people, too, because they're so protected. They're so isolated. And so you really do see this pure way of life. There's no media. There's no TVs. It's just very simple living connected to nature. And that's that if you ever get a chance, even if it's not specific to, uh, to India, um, but just to be in that kind of space is, is just a wonderful thing. Um, so that, that's certainly where I, I would, uh, direct people. And then other than that, if you haven't been in Fenway park, um, you know, it's, it's a great place to watch a baseball game. Seth, you know what I aspire next year <laughs> to go with you and sit through a Red Sox game. Can we make that happen? 
<laughs> I love to. You know, I'm already. You could see me. I wear a Tom Brady jersey. I've I've already given you all that respect. It's hard to respect Woody Johnson and the Jets. So I've converted. I would love to go with you to Fenway Park. Let's make a day to that. Let's do it. That'd be great. All right. I'll look forward to seeing you soon. Best of everything in your new venture. Can't wait to hear more about it. And all my love to Julie and the boys. Thanks, Harry. Great to be with you. Same here, Seth. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode of How We Doing It, hit the subscribe button so future episodes are automatically downloaded directly to your device. And if you want access to today's show notes, including links to all the resources mentioned, visit HowWeDoingIt.com. That's H-O-W-I-E-D-O-I-N-I-T.com. Until next time, stay resilient and keep pushing forward.